Welcome in Rose City on this Friday, October 27th, 2023. 1989 Taylor's version playing on the speakers of every home in America. We are here. That's the to... that's the haters gonna hate uh, album, right? Haters gonna hate, hate, hate. That, that, it's that Shake one? it off. Shake it off. Yes, that's the one. yes, that's the song. All right, I, I'm, I'm glad I got that right. <laughs> Have you ever seen the 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 goats version of that on YouTube? There's a there's a goat remix of that song. It's it's <laughs> phenomenal. I have not seen that, but that sounds good very stuff. funny. Okay. <laughs> it's good stuff. This episode off, starting phenomenally as usual. Yeah, we're off to a brilliant start here um, in what is... Wait, no, I'm sorry. I got the song wrong. It's the, it's the I knew you were trouble when you walked in. That's the one with the good goat remix. So are they just buying or what's the... Yeah, what's at, the, the... at the part where she, you know, uh, emotes verbally. I don't know what I would call what, 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 what she does. It replaces that. But with like the the goats yelling like humans thing, um, and it's 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 really strong content. It's kind of an oldie, but it's a goodie uh, from the from the early days of the memification of the internet. Uh, it's it's really strong. So I, I'm sorry for that that diversion, me getting the, the the song mixed up. But go go like get on YouTube, uh, g- give that a search. Um, it's it's really strong stuff. I, I hope she she worked it into the the, the re release. She did not. That's a shame. Um, you know, we we've listened to most of it here at the the Knight Clark household, what and she thoughts? she has yet to. Oh, it's great. I, I you know I'm not even like a big Taylor Swift fan, as I've said before, but I will say that the re recorded version of this album, obviously, you know, nine years later, the production is is significantly better, and and I think that her voice has has evolved in a lot of ways. A little too, more, a little, little more sounds, maturity and sophistication to the the, the sound and the presentation. Certainly, nice. I think it's 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 a very solid record. We've we've got two different vinyls uh, coming. Two vinyls. I bought, I, wow. I bought one. I bought one for Emma as a gift, and she she bought one for herself uh, without, oh, of course, me, me kind knowing of at the time. So so that's hilarious. But do y'all have uh, a record that, player, or do you just collect the vinyls as collectors' items? We do have a record player. For a while, we didn't. We were the sort of collector people, but now we, now we got one set up in the living so room. You spin so you spent. Yeah, we'll we'll spin some records nice. here. Nice, um, very hipster of you. Yeah. Speaking of spin, the Portland Timbers oh. uh, just finished uh, <laughs> just just finished off their season and had a uh, end of season press conference. That was a nice with, transition, with by Ned the way. Grabovoy. I, I, I don't Thank want you. this to get too far away before I give you your flowers on that. That was a nice transition. Thank you. Uh, Ned Grabovoy spoke yesterday with uh, with an eye towards what is going to be a busy off season for the Portland Timbers. Uh, of course, the Timbers lose on decision day to Houston. All the other things go wrong for them in terms of results around the league, and they miss out on the playoffs. Uh, Sporting Kansas City jumps in and ends up winning in, in the play-in game, uh, so they'll face St. Louis City, a matchup that you know the Timbers would not have been mad about if they got in. But given the nature of this season given a lot of the struggles that they had i think that it's probably better for the team's future and for the changes that ned grabavoy himself admitted need to be made there's your spin that that they didn't make the the playoffs yeah there's there's spinning your spin. it spinning it like taylor yeah th- spin the record here um and and you know obviously two years in a row missing the playoffs you know in in ned's words a major failure yeah. something that you know is below the standards of the club for the previous decade of its existence and um, is a big reason why they fired Gio Savarese halfway through the season. It's a big reason why they're, you know, seeking a new head coach now, whether it's Miles Joseph or one of the outside candidates, we will find out in the next few days, according to Ned. Um, But there's a lot of roster movement too. Um, You know, Ned himself announced that Alias Ivacic had requested a trade, which was, pretty well known for a while <laughs> no, given no no surprise there that was <laughs> yeah given what happened there and even ned didn't um, didn't exactly treat that like it was some big revelation i think he even in his comments it was it was pretty clear that he regarded that also as not being particularly you know newsy news right right it's just it's part of the situation when he was suspended for the final three games of the season due to allegedly using threatening language towards staff members which obviously was the sort of crescendo of this messy situation um, to say the least. And so Ivacic is, is probably gone, uh, if not definitely 
gone in the off season. Uh, and then Yaroslav Nishkoda, who is recovering from an end season ending ACL tear. Uh, he is leaving the club. His option was not picked up. Uh, the two other options that the team has to look at uh, Sebastian Blanco club legend, and then David Bingham. Um, they have yet to make a decision on those, but uh, according to Ned, um, Ned and, and Merritt Paulson have been speaking pretty regularly uh, with Sebastian Blanco and his representation um, to to sort of decide the next steps. My hunch, based on on the way that Ned framed it and sort of spoke about doing what's best for the team in in the same breath as as these Blanco discussions, is that this is probably the end for Sebastian Blanco in a Timbers uniform. Um, you know, he's he's dealt with pretty debilitating uh, knee issues over the last couple of years to the point where it's affected his day-to-day life. We, we talked earlier this year about, um, Seba sharing with me that, you know, he couldn't climb up the stairs at home. He couldn't, you know, play with his kids on the floor because of some of these chronic knee issues. Um, and, and that's a point in, in any footballer's career where, um, you, you sort of have to, to make a decision that you think is best for you, but also for, for your family. Um, we'll see where Seba stands in terms of his health, in terms of his desire to maybe play one other year for another club if he so chooses. But it seems to me, and this obviously isn't official yet, that uh, that Seba is done uh, with the Timbers. Um, an additional bit of, you know, context and, and newsiness that came out of um, the last couple of days. Ned, of course, himself did not announce these things. But uh, Dario Zuperich requested a trade, um, which is obviously a big loss. Somebody who has been an anchor along the back line and one of the hardest working and honestly most quotable people <laughs> on the Timbers uh, is is likely to leave this offseason after requesting a trade. Uh, my understanding is that he's upset with the sort of direction of the club the last two years and, and the lack of winning that has occurred, which, you know, given... Given what's gone on, that's that would be understandable. Those are feelings based in, based in fact, I suppose. And um, additionally, Jimmy Chara unlikely to return to the club with a year left on his deal. That's something that we had posited as a possibility. Maybe though, the biggest uh, news out of this bunch. Yes, yeah, potentially the biggest news there. Uh, just given, you know, obviously he's Diego's brother, but also he came in as a DP and is still a DP, and um, you know, did not obviously live up to those expectations and you know, is somebody that they're going to look to move on from and add probably one or two DPs this off season. Like as, as you pointed out, it would have to be a young DP and then a, a senior DP um, looking to attack it, looking to add a DP attacker. Uh, and then just rounding out this, this laundry list of off season items, which just sort of all hit the fan at once. Uh, Frank Bully is, is reportedly going to leave. Um, that's, that's according to sources. He declined, uh, the club's proposal to return apparently. Um, and defender Zach McGraw, uh, is, is looking to get a significant pay raise as well. Somebody who is on a pretty low number given the contributions that he gives to this team. So it makes sense that, that he's after that, but, um, definitely pro- a priority I'm sure for, for the Timbers this off season. So all that being said, all of those, Layers upon layers of of items. Uh, what stands out to you, Chris, as as we enter the off season? Uh, so yeah, let's look forward. I, I do want to make sure that at some point we will be looking back. Uh, but let's look forward first uh, at, at at these issues. Um, uh, you know the the biggest news I think was was Jimmy Chara. Uh, obviously had recurring health issues this last year. Uh, that the Timbers given his age and all of that and how recurring the issues were, the Timbers should be very concerned about. Oh, that's something that you don't want to carry a DP into a season. And they've done this in the past. So, you know, it wasn't, this wasn't a foregone conclusion, but you don't want to carry a DP into a season without confidence that he's going to be able to play. And, uh, I don't think that there was reason to have a lot of confidence that Jimmy Char was going to be able to be on the field consistently in 2024 more so than he was in 2023 and even when he was on the field he was not a particularly impactful player and this is something that we've been saying for a while uh he's a solid player don't get me wrong i I, you know i I don't want to throw dirt on the guy he's he's always been a solid player for the for the timbers uh but in terms of dp level impact he's really never provided that 
And so I actually kind of feel like the decision with respect to Jimmy Chara for 2024 is really similar to the decision that the Timbers had with respect to Yaroslav Nishkoda with 2023, right? One year left on the contract, mounting health issues, kind of okay, but not great performance. In 2023, the the Timbers chose to keep that guy, right? They chose to keep Nishkoda and essentially just let his contract expire. Uh, but to carry his cap hit and to carry him on the roster over the course of the season. Here, it looks like they're making a different decision with respect to Jimmy Chara. Uh, I think if you go back and listen to our podcast from last offseason, you would not have a hard time figuring out where I stood on that decision last year. So frankly, I, I think it's it's much more welcome uh, that the Timbers are being more proactive about moving on from from Jimmy at this point. Certainly I hope wherever he goes next he finds both health and success. Um but I think that's in in terms of, you know, harkening back to what Ned said about the uh the need to make these decisions, you know, in the best interest of the team. That's one of them. Uh and it's a decision that they didn't make last year. I think we saw how that turned out. Uh and they seem to be doing something different this year. So that's that's I think very welcome news. Yeah, and and I think that you know to that point, this is is sort of the the first cycle through an off season for Ned after this this first year at the helm, right? He you know he took over as interim after Gavin Wilkinson's firing last fall. But they left him interim um, for three months, <laughs> but they left him interim for a while, and uh, frankly, his office was not filled out. Now you know they, as, as he said, are hiring a director of scouting. And that's been a, a drawn out process, according, according to Ned. But, you know, he's got Jack Dodd in there um, as, as a fellow executive to sort of help guide that department and, and start to get some scouting boots on the ground for, for that side of things. Um, but but in terms of of that specific decision and, you know, how it squares with the Nia's go to decision, um, I think Ned is just in a, in a better position now to to take that honest yeah. approach after obviously a season where, you know, it didn't cut, cut it for the club and, you know, fans obviously are upset and, you know, the, the standards have not been met in, in the words of Ned Grabovoy. Um, you know, he, he has more freedom and I think experience in the job now to, to do this and to say, as he did look like we need to take an honest approach. Uh, we need to look at this roster and be willing to make some tough decisions. And some of those decisions are moving on from players that have been at this club either for a while or, uh, you know, have been in key roles for this club or, or were major investments. Um, you know, one player that they're going to bring back that I, I forgot to note in my laundry list of, of stuff is uh, Santiago Moreno, who obviously had the transfer request drama earlier this year. Walked it back, got a new agent. They the team helped move his mom up from Colombia to Portland on on a temporary visa. That's been a huge help for for Santi. And you know, there's there's nothing like you know mom's cooking and and mom's presence in your life to to sort of elevate your your uh, your attitude, your feelings uh, in general. So I'm I'm very happy for Santi and and for his mom uh, to be able to witness her son be a professional soccer player after everything she went through raising her kids and, and, you know, Santi went through as a kid growing up in Cali. Um, that that's a, a very compelling and positive story just as an aside, but, and, um, and you know, yep. I, I think I agreed with Ned's comments that, that, you know, in the last 10 games, Santi was the guy who was a different guy uh, yes. than he was in the first 24. Yeah. And, and so I, I think, I, I think, you know, there's, there's reason for hope there that, that that's going to turn out better than it did. Uh, some of the other sort of newsy bits that we got with respect to Zachary McGraw, it is not surprising at all to me uh, that he feels like he deserves more money. The reason he feels like he deserves more money is because he deserves more money. Uh, and so <laughs> that is, again, another another feeling like like Zoop Riches. That's another feeling that's based in fact. And it, I think I would expect something to get done here because it's really in the Timbers interest as well to keep a player that uh, as as good a quality as as Zach has shown to keep him sort of on you know a long-term contract in which he's being compensated about what he's he's producing and because yeah, and, the he, Timbers, and he's the type of guy too you know that that you can mold into I think a, a real like 
club yeah, guy, for sure. right? Like a guy, like a guy that can be, you know, after Diego Chara retires, that can be your captain, yep. that can be a vocal leader, and that can represent, you know, what you you uh, want your club's values to be. And they right? need is, more is of the hard, work, yeah. not less of it. Which yeah, I exactly. think I think Ned spoke to as well. Uh, he, you know, I, I look not to like hide the ball here. In listening to a lot of Ned's comments, uh, I agreed with most of them. Frankly, I, I I thought I was much more heartened by his comments yesterday than I was what we were hearing out of that the 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 front office at toward the beginning of the year near the end of last off season. Um, I think these were much more clear eyed. Uh, but you know, I mean, get, getting back to the 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 point about McGraw. Because the Timbers don't have to pay any acquisition cost for him, they can pay him what he deserves in terms of salary and still achieve relative value for him. And so, I mean, that's just something that that where everybody's interests here should align to getting McGraw bumped up uh, in terms of salary, keeping him happy, keeping him here for the long term uh, for for the club. So I, I expect that to happen uh, and and if the club is is saying that he is requesting that, uh, I expect that that's an indication that they also uh, are amenable to doing that. So I expect that to get done. With respect to Blanco, it's it's an interesting question. Obviously, he is he is a free agent, and we knew his contract was going to be up at the end of the year. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what decision Seba makes, uh, because you know I mean look he was uh, after he got back and fit. He he made a lot of appearances, right? He made 17 appearances over the course of the season. He was available in lots of games. So it's not like he had recurring injury issues, but he still only played 427 minutes. And if your expectations for 2024 are anything different or anything higher than that, you're unrealistic. And and so, you know, I I, I think... Blanco probably has some decision making to to do in terms of what he wants to do and what's right for him in 2024. I'm not opposed to the idea of if he wants to play in 2024 and if he is willing to take a reasonable salary number. It's not going to be the 1.6 million that he was making this last year. In fact, it's probably not going to be one fifth of that. Um. But if if he's willing to play another year for a number that the Timbers can work into the salary cap without, you know, losing their ability to do other things, I do think there's value in having somebody like Sebo Blanco on the team, even if he's not playing a ton. Oh, the, the Timbers are going next year, it seems, to have a lot of young players, to have a lot of players who are new to MLS. Uh, and so having a guy like him on the team has value. Uh even if it's not necessarily value that you can pay five hundred or six hundred thousand dollars for uh, within within the confines of the salary cap, and so we'll see. I, I guess I I probably land about where you land, which is that I think it's likelier than not that he won't return. Um, but we'll see what his preferences are and whether they can get to a point. You know, I mean, if they can get him on a contract next year for two hundred fifty thousand dollars or something like that, I think I think. That's pretty justifiable. Um, but I don't know if Sebo wants to do that. I don't know uh, if, if that's in his interest. And if not, I will be a little bit sad uh, because Blanco has been a tremendous contributor to the club uh, over his time here. I mean, he's been in Portland now for, what, seven, eight years? Um, and his contributions have been fantastic. Plain and simple. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he, you know, I, I would be, be somewhat regretful uh, that fans didn't sort of have the opportunity to give him the send off that he deserves um, and to give him the respect and the flowers that I think uh, his overall contributions to the club warrant. So I'll be a little bit sad about that. If this is the end, it feels like it kind of an anticlimactic, like just kind of just happened end. Um, but it's also just the difficulty of managing these late career stages and getting everybody aligned in terms of when things are going to ramp down. That's hard in most cases. Yeah, um, it's hard to tell competitors like, you know, Seba too, even, even if he understands the reality of the situation, it's it's hard for people like that to walk away. Um, 
yeah, I I just started watching Ted Lasso. In fact, for 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 the really? people in in yeah, I just started. I I finished season one, um, and I'm in the midst of season two currently. And um, you know, spoiler alert for those who like me have don't taken need to forever, do spoiler alert. We're all caught this. up. You're the one who's behind. <laughs> I am. I'm the one who's behind. Um. You know, I, I think about Roy Kent <laughs> and I think about, you know, the end of, of his career in, in that show. And and frankly, I sat there and it made me, you know, not to compare the two because one is a fictional character with <laughs> f- fic- fictional ambitions and fictional emotions. And the other is a real human being with, you know, you know these this entire career that he's built in soccer. But it reminded me of Saban. It reminded me of, of the type of competitor um, he is and how difficult it is for any competitor to to step away from the game and to sort of listen to to their body um you know it's only Seba knows where he's at right now and if he's able to sort of lace up the boots again next year whether it's here or Argentina or somewhere else um you know it's it's going to be ultimately up to him but I, th- I think he has a really strong foundation in place with you know his family and you know the people around him the friendships he's built that um you know he'll be good and and he's it, unquestionably i mean you have to you have to look at what he's done for the club and and the sort of you know cult hero that he became with the chucky mask and everything else like all the all the crazy exciting by the way fi- just the fiery wrong moments. nickname just the wrong nickname it should have been lil sebastian all along yeah i yeah that's probably we did it wrong. probably more we more his it. That's more probably his lack of desire to be called Lil Sebastian bye, than maybe. Bye, Lil Sebastian. I'll miss yeah. you in the saddest fashion. <laughs> it's great stuff. It's good stuff. Ta sh- did. Ta never did that. I. I mean, that never had the opportunity. If nothing else, they mm. should bring him back on a one day contract so we can sing him that song. Yeah, I mean, he's probably a guy that's going to go in the Ring of Honor, right? I think he probably gets there maybe not sort of a first ballot ring of honor guy like diego valeri but i think he i, I think he's he's got a good case oh um, yeah chara would probably chara gets there first there. yeah i mean yeah. chara gets there first i mean y- y- you know i and this is an impossible standard to hold anybody to but uh, but yeah i mean un- i mean I, I i think there are i i think in terms of timbers mls history there's the top two right the, there's the diegos and then third, I think, is is fairly unquestionable is is Seba in terms of influence over the course of this period, and uh, and so you know I don't want to take anything away from him by comparing him to the Diegos because the Diegos stand alone, um, or at least together, but separate from everybody else. Uh, but in terms of the non Diego category, uh, you know, I mean, he, he's he's certainly up there. So yeah, I mean, I I'm very much open to Blanco being a Ring of Honor inductee, uh, but not sort of a no brainer like Valeria or Chara. Yeah, and they're I mean, they're filling up that space over there, you know, pretty pretty quickly with with modern people, and will fill it up as as when Chara steps away, whether that's like two years from now or five years, who knows? The guy is just ageless, but <laughs> um, but they also have to you know add names unquestionably to the Portland Thorns section. Christine Sinclair's will obviously be the first one yep. after next year. And then there'll be more unquestionably in They're the future. But speaking to this off season and speaking ahead to sort of, you know, the, the changes and the new people that Ned talked about wanting to bring in for the Timbers. Um, the, the targeting a DP attacking player is something that they've spoken about privately for, a while is something that they, they want to kind of get rolling something here spoken about basically each of the last several off seasons. So, right. And so, so now is sort of the moment when you're saying that we will be in the market to look at DP attacking players, um, that, that you do that. They're also looking to add depth along the back line. Obviously you, you expect that not only will Dario Zuperich be gone, but Larry Smabiala at his, his age and, and career stage likely would not be back either. They haven't, said either way and you know sources haven't told me either way what's what's going to happen with Larice but it's pretty plain that you know given the, the point in his career that it's it's probably not going to be with the Timbers next year um so you've got Zach and Miguel Araujo and that's pretty much it and for your center yeah backs right I mean I, I think given the little that we saw from Araujo this year you're probably looking to bring in a starting level center back 
and basically you have Zach and then allow Araujo and then whoever you sign to compete for the second spot with the option to play in, in a three back setup. Um, if, uh, if everybody sort of warrants a starting spot, uh, and the ability to do that, I, I, so I, I think it's more than a depth piece, uh, that they're going to have to look for, uh, in central defense. Uh, I think they're going to have to make some different decisions, at least in terms of depth at the fullback positions. Uh, I, I don't think that's a position, especially over the course of the season, uh, that acquitted itself particularly well defensively. Uh, and there are different things tactically that they can do to help out there. But frankly, I don't think you want to constrain somebody like Mosquera too much uh, by by sort of pinning him in. And so I think at least in terms of the depth positions uh, at fullback, they're going to have to reinforce there. The attacking positions are interesting. Um, You know, with Boley not coming back, they obviously need to make a playing level signing uh, at number nine. Somebody who you can give 15, 20 starts to and and feel okay about that. Yeah, and you imagine that would be the DP. Maybe. I mean, yeah. Felipe Mora played really well. Better than I expected, frankly, uh, when he got back. And so I, you know, it's... It's interesting because that number nine position is, is I ag- agree with you, sort of the most, I guess the easiest position to say, yes, they should go out and sign a DP at that spot. But that would cut off Felipe Mora from being a regular starter. And I'm not sure that's warranted. If he's going to be healthy and if he's going to be in the form that he showed over the course of the last 10 or 12 games, Mora showed that he was a starting level number nine. Yeah, and and if you put the right and highly talented like attacking midfielder right behind him, I mean that that to me, you know, when you're talking about a move that isn't a number nine, makes the most sense too. Particularly given that you tried to sort of you know slot Evander in there, and it turned out that he's better served you know a little further back. Yeah, I, mean, I don't that, think you that, can play that makes Evander a lot of sense. Too much deeper. Uh, I it, my opinion of Evander is, is is largely the same as when he came in that he looks like he is in a system where you've got sort of a three-man central midfield. It looks to me like he's, if you've got sort of a six and two eights system, he's the most advanced eight. That's kind of, that's who he is. If you're, if you want to talk about the U S men's national team, he's your Western McKinney. And, uh, and I think they actually they have some pretty sensible choices for the other two uh, players in that central midfield. The guy who I can't get in there and who I think is going to be a big decision for the Timbers this offseason, at least is one that they should be thinking about proactively, even though conditions for moving him are not optimal, is Eric Williamson. I think Evander and Eric Williamson are basically the, the, the same type of player. Uh, and I think they're both pretty good. I think it's not optimal to move a guy coming off a long-term injury like Williamson is. But I don't see a way while maintaining sort of defensive balance in central midfield to play both Evander and Williamson at the same time. Maybe I'll be proven wrong. I was not proven wrong when those two did play together early in the season. I was very much proven corrected in, in that concern because that was a huge problem. And that w- that was mooted somewhat by the fact that that Williamson got hurt, but I I don't know how that dynamic works. I think when you look at the wings, that is another position where it probably makes sense. I think the Timbers have some potential there. Santiago Moreno, obviously, if he comes in and is sort of the guy who we saw over the course of the last couple months of the season, you would expect him to be a regular starter. But look, I mean, we did we can't completely ignore the 24 games that preceded that. And so I don't think you would say that Moreno is a sure bet uh, on the end. And also, you know, speaking to Moreno, I I think that, um, you know, you you could argue, and this is something he has pushed for privately that, you know, maybe he's the person that you slot in as that sort of quasi number 10. Then where do you put you Well, yeah. And then you make that major investment uh, in the, in the winger and then keep Evander sort of, you know, back, back as the central eight, you're going to get, you're going to get torn up because Evander didn't defend consistently. He did some sure. times. Yeah. I, but, I think there like were you, stretches you that were, you that were have that. You can't have a situation where you've got a six and then two eights slash tens who don't defend 
or don't reliably defend. You need somebody who's going to reliably do that defensive work to pair with your number six. Uh, yeah, I mean, per- Paredes and Char are like unmoving pieces of this. I, I, they yeah. speak so highly now, Paredes, that like they they see him as as an essential part of the long term future here. They declined a pretty serious like two million dollar offer from from a team in Brazil for him. Like yeah. they and I would have declined that offer too. Yeah, they're sticking with him. So that that's the that's the rub, right? That's why it's difficult to to sort of map out where that DP attacking player would fit and who they would sort of slot out in order for it to, I mean, to the, work. The other spot that I th- I think may, would make sense is another is a really high quality wide forward. Cuz I mean the two the two guys who you have, I mean if you keep sort of the 4-3-3 sort of basic setup that this roster is built for right now, although they can reconstruct it don't get me wrong. Uh, they would just have to make some different choices. Uh, but that 4 through 3 setup that the roster is built for right now, uh, I think those wing positions are probably the weakest. Because you've got Antony on one side. And look, I mean, we saw about 90 minutes of good soccer from Antony this year, which I, is not a criticism. That's basically what we saw from Santi Moreno his first year. It is difficult for young players to come in and make an immediate impact. He didn't have a ton of runway. The fact that we saw 90 minutes or so of really good soccer from Anthony suggests that there's something there. And yeah, the, and, and I think the potential is absolutely there for him yeah. just in terms of his athletic ability and, and you know, what he could bring. But are you looking at Anthony as an in-pin starter in 2024? You're absolutely not, right? You're not doing that. Uh, and so I think that's uh, a, a wide forward is is a spot that would make some sense uh, to to sign a, a DP attacking player, um, but they would need to add sort of at least a, a, another number nine to compete with and and be depth for Mora, especially given Mora's injury issues. Um, and frankly, they don't have a ton of other great options at those wide for at, at, at those wing spots, right? Uh, Dyron Espria was a guy who I think is you know is not the 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 contributor that he was in say twenty twenty one. When he was excellent, um, and that that happens. I mean, he's kind of just at that stage of his career, uh, but did not find that kind of form again. I think you probably keep Aspria around, but you're not counting on Aspria to start a ton of games, and you probably shouldn't be. Oh, um, and so that's the spot that it, that if it's me, I would probably look to target uh, with that DP signing. Oh, um, but I think they also have a number of hard decisions to make in central midfield. I think Ned alluded to one, which is whether to bring back uh, Brian Acosta. I think the Timbers should decline his option because his his option is almost certainly at a little bit higher salary than Acosta was on this year. And he's expensive, right? He was like the sixth or seventh most expensive guy on the roster. He was, he's over uh, the designated, the, the, the TAM threshold in terms of salary. And he's just not that player, but if you can bring him back on a, on a, on, you know, for $300,000 or something like that, where you can justify him to being a depth piece, I think he performed that, uh, to that level. And that would make sense. You're working David Ajala back in. He is the guy who the Timbers have pegged as sort of the successor at that number six position, uh, to Diego Chara. Oh, you hope certainly that he's going to be back ready to go around the beginning of camp or sometime around there uh, to uh, to be back to full health. And frankly, we saw some pretty good stuff from him in short minutes this year. So I, I th- frankly, I think that's where the roster logjam is, that they kind of have to figure out what they're going to do and how to alleviate that logjam and sort of have a clear structure within that group. Uh, to figure out how they're going to play. And this is all the kind of stuff that I think a coach is critical for, right? Because how your coach is going to wants to set up that central midfield is going to dictate a lot of those decisions. And that's why I'm, I've been anxious for the Timbers to make the coaching hire so that they can make these offseason roster moves in a way that aligns with how the new coach wants to play. Um, and so hopefully they do make that decision in the next week or so. Hopefully they make a good decision. <laughs> I think there are some that might not be great decisions, but it, whatever, you know, hopefully they make a good decision there uh, and that that coach has the opportunity to sort of help shape the roster within their vision of how uh, they want to play. Of those candidates, I mean, it there there are some that are, you know, obviously putting up 
red flags for a lot of people yeah. I mean, <laughs> in this community. That was not a not a compelling list as we discussed last week. But um, there there are names on there that you know have have seemed like more logical choices to fans and to people on the outside maybe than uh, than others. Um, you know, the idea that whoever is hired, if it's not Miles, which given the team's performance at the end of the season and not making the playoffs, it seems less likely now that Miles would be the higher than it was, you know, when they were at the peak of this sort of late season turnaround. Um, but whoever that hire is, it feels like almost an edict from the organization that, you know, regardless of who gets hired, Miles and Ridgie probably have to be at least some part of that coach shouldn't staff, be an right edict. shouldn't yeah, be yeah. an edict i mean it shouldn't it shouldn't be but it might be that's, yeah but it should thing just and, okay. and look I, I mean i think uh miles and his staff in the last 10 games did a good job um it wasn't perfect <laughs> it shows some some cracks at the end uh, but they did a good job and they deserve respect and credit for that uh I don't think uh, Miles should get the permanent job. And that really has less to do with his performance as interim manager and more to do with the fact that this is a club that is just, I mean, I'll say it, just desperate at this point for an infusion of fresh ideas and new leadership. I think the club just needs that. I I don't think they can afford to make another another internal hire in a position as prominent as this. And, you know, I mean, if 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 Miles's work had had just knocked me off my feet, had been, you know, 10 out of 10 no notes, uh, you know, maybe you reconsider that because the the candidate that you just have is just too strong. It wasn't that. It was more seven out of ten. Oh, uh, Still good. Don't get me wrong, uh, but uh, but it wasn't that. And I th- so I think the need for new leadership and new ideas, uh, and lacking not having some of the baggage from just some of the things that have gone on within the club in the last few years, is really critical just for the health of the club. And so I I don't think they should hire Miles Joseph. Um, I think it's possible that they will in no small part because the other candidates whom we know that they've been talking to have been less than compelling. They each have some warts on them to say the least in some instances. And, uh, and so, you know, maybe, maybe they don't have a lot of other attractive choices, but I'm a big believer, assuming that they do go outside to make this higher as I think they should. And to be clear, we also don't know everybody who's in consideration that's it's always been sort of out there that there are other names in consideration so you know we can only talk about those whom we've seen uh but who knows maybe yeah there was one there was one maybe Zinedine Zidane is is you know the maybe Diego Valeri maybe Diego Valeri who just got his coaching license yes is the dark horse (laughs) but I mean assuming they do go outside I am a very big believer that a coach should be allowed to make their to build their own staff and look i mean don't get me wrong i have no problem with the timbers saying hey we've got you know we've had liam ridgewell here we've had miles joseph here these are two guys whom we believe in and if you want them on your staff we will make that happen um but i don't think it's a good idea to hire a coach and then handcuff them with people on their staff whom they may or may not want uh, I think that's a bad idea, and so you know, I I would I too would like to see Joseph back because I I mean it, I think he showed that he is somebody who has some ideas that can contribute and that can be part of a good coaching staff. I Ridgey think Liam too. Ridgewell too. Yeah. Uh, those would are guys whom I would like to see back, but like it's kind of just how it goes sometimes. Even when you have an assistant who you like and who you think has potential. If the head coach leaves and you bring in somebody new, like sometimes you do just lose those guys. And that's okay. Sometimes they come back, right? I mean, sometimes the, they get another job. And I think both Ridgewell and Joseph would get other jobs in MLS pretty easily. Oh, sometimes they, they go to other jobs. They get a few more years of experience. And then sometimes they come back as head coaches. 
when they've got a, a, a couple more notches on their belt. But I don't think it's a good idea to dictate to any hire whom they sh- they need to hire to have on their staff. Right. And, and, you know, in terms of the most likely person or people that, that would keep those two guys on staff, um, the, the logical one in my mind is if they hire Robin Frazier and, uh, you know, he has a longstanding relationship with, uh, with miles dating back to the RSL days. Um, when I believe they were both assistant coaches at that time. Um, so it, as part of a larger staff, which would obviously include new people, um, that seems like the scenario under which Miles and and Riggi would be most likely to stay. Weirdly, you know, just given how things are structured and sort of the the importance of of each individual coach and and their specialty, I feel like it's almost more likely that somebody like Riggi stays on a staff as an assistant than maybe miles does because maybe miles maybe. sees an opportunity with another club where either, you know, he's got a track to be the head coach there or, you know, has a more prominent role than maybe he would under coach X or whoever they, they end up hiring in Portland. Um, but by that same token, miles, I think really has a, has a love and appreciation for a lot of the guys in this locker room and, and has developed a strong relationship with a lot. of Yeah. Them. And, and look, this isn't to, to say this is Ridwell's fault. And it's not to say that uh, I don't think Ridwell did a good enough job to to warrant coming back. I, I think both of those things. This team also conceded 10 goals in the last three games of the season. Like, it's not like they started pitching shutouts regularly uh, when Ridgewell sort of rose in prominence after Gio left. Um, so, you know, I mean, let, let's keep let, let's keep that in the proper context. They gave up 10 yeah. goals in the final three games of the season, and that's why they're not playing soccer anymore. Yeah, and you want to talk about a Roy Kent-type character, <laughs> yeah. Liam Ridgewell. Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> but, right. Uh, uh, but so, anyway. you know, I mean, I, I, I think, in, is there anything that I saw from the last 10 games that makes me think that either of them are sort of like slam dunk, you absolutely need to have this guy back kinds of folks? No. Oh, are they guys who... You would like to see back, yes, absolutely, and 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 can they can they contribute to a good coaching staff? Yes. If that's not the direction though that the new coach wants to go, I don't think you 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 tell them that they have to do something. Um, because I who think, do you think who do you think is the most likely then of, of, of the of the candidates? Look, I right you know it's impossible for me to get in the head of Merritt Paulson and 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 Ned Grabavoy in making this decision. Obviously, that's where the decision is being made, and. Uh, I just, it's, it's not like there is a connection between our brains. I'll put it that way. Uh, so, you know, I don't know, uh, which direction they're thinking of going of the names that we've seen. And I, I underline of the names that we've seen, because they're, as I, as I mentioned, there are names we haven't, I agree with you that Robin Frazier is the one that interests me the most, but like Frazier's got some warts on him too. The last two years in Colorado were not good. And, and there are definitely other reasons for that. Oh, don't, you know, I mean, there, there's is that at that club, especially there are other reasons for that. And I am curious about, I mean, Robin Frazier, unfortunately, in, in the two head coaching jobs that he's had has been saddled with the two probably least ambitious clubs in recent MLS history in the Colorado Rapids and Chivas USA. And there have been times in which those, those teams have played well under his leadership, but they've also not played well under his leadership. And so, like, there's there's kind of a curiosity of, like, boy, what would it be like if Robin Frazier got a job at a place that, like, had some ambition to do something? So I acknowledge that there's that curiosity. I have it, too. Uh, but I think I think it's an open question. And whether you want to sort of take that risk as, as uh, with your club <laughs> or would rather somebody else do that experiment – uh, is a reasonable question. That said, I mean, of the names that I've seen, that's the one that I'm most interested in, uh, in terms of how that could go. Um, and, uh, you know, if it was, if that was my list of candidates and I was making the hire, that's probably the direction I'd go. The other candidates on the list being, um, Ezra Hendrickson, Dome Torrent, uh, Miles and Phil Neville and, and also, uh, a, an unnamed, 
<laughs> an unnamed league MX coach. Yeah, I, I, um, I mean, I can't comment so. on that because you have no idea who the coach uh, sure. coaches from Liga MX. That is the relevant information. The fact that somebody coached in Liga MX isn't exactly like, you know, doesn't make them a slam dunk <laughs> in terms of a hire. Um, Dome Torrent is, is interesting as well. I don't know. I mean, it, it is interesting, but like kind of left MLS under weird circumstances and frankly has done nothing in the last three years, lasted less than six months at two jobs. I think one at Flamenco, if I'm remembering right in Brazil and then another at Galatasaray in, 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 in Turkey, um, uh, lasted less than six months in both of those. And that's what he has done this decade. So, uh, so that, I mean, that, that isn't exactly a clear hire. I would probably go Frazier over him. Ezra Hendrickson is, I think, universally regarded as a, a really good person, is, has had some success as an, as an assistant coach. Chicago Fire under him were an absolute dumpster fire, and that is a roster that actually has some money invested into it. Lots of issues on the sporting side of that club as well that may not necessarily be attributable to him. But coming out of that job, that was not a, a situation, I think, where anybody was saying, boy, that guy should immediately be gobbled up as somebody who's going to uh, who's going to warrant being a good uh, MLS head coach. Phil Neville, uh, as the raspberry suggests, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Failed, course, repeatedly failed soccer coach. Also, lots of reporting about maybe not a great human. Absolutely not. Of course, for context, for people who may not be aware um, of, of the non-soccer side of things, which we, we can talk at length about sort of the the various spots that Phil Neville's been at the last few years and the lack of success that, that he's had there. And, and Chris has, has been, you know, on record with those was those things. But additionally, you know, and, and what he's hinting to here is is the off field concerns with Phil Neville and something that, you know, there's just not a whole lot of appetite for in Portland from the fan base after everything that's gone on with the club the last couple of years. Uh, Neville, you know, posted, frankly, extremely sexist stuff on Twitter uh, and was criticized for it and apologized and and everything else. But I mean, it's not like they were tweets from when he was like a 13 year old kid. No. And and when he was in his 20s, he got flack for it. He was very much an adult not terribly younger than he was at the time of apology, fully formed prefrontal cortex. I mean, just said, said stuff that was inexcusably and ridiculously sexist, like almost cartoonishly sexist. And, and whether he carries those attitudes or not, like it's not for me to say, I don't know the man. Um, But, but putting stuff like that on the internet at any time in the history of the internet as a, as a grown adult, like it's just, it's ridiculous and something that grown grass adult. Yeah. Front of mind for people in, in this city and, and in particular a city that is, is such a hub of, of success in women's soccer. Uh, and you know, we know about the, the lack of success for Neville in that realm. That's not to say yeah, I that mean, England got manifestly better after he left. <laughs> like, right. Right. And so, you know, Miami, that, that's, I mean, you know, Miami's a little bit different story because some other things happened messy etc after he yeah. left but like they were awful under him right. awful terror the worst i mean this is again an objective fact the worst team in the league even though they had a roster that although flawed and everybody agrees was flawed should not have been a worst team in the league roster phil neville made him the worst team in the league i don't really want to see him come do the same in portland it would be interesting in terms of that that being the decision. Absolutely um, not. I, I, as I said last week, if if the Timbers hire Phil Neville, we're going to have a non family show episode. And of course, I won't advocate either way for any any candidate. Don't in, hire in terms Phil Neville. of my job. <laughs> this is the difference between me and Chris outlined right here. Is is you know our ability to sort of advocate versus not advocate. Um, but there are a lot of questions that would need to obviously be answered by the organization, by Neville himself, if that were to happen. I don't see it happening, given everything that's going on in the last couple of years. I don't, I don't see it happening, but years. frankly, I was a little bit shocked to even see his name come up in that list. It is and interesting, may, may, because, maybe because those type of is, lists... Maybe Neville himself was sort of seeding that, and that didn't come from the Timbers. Maybe they regard him as less of a candidate than was presented. Oh, but... I mean, he doesn't get to the resume screen for me, let alone become a finalist. 
So we'll see which among the finalists, if any of the ones that have been announced publicly, the Timbers end up hiring. That announcement should be coming probably next week, according to Ned Grabavoy. So that, that's something to keep an eye on. Um, next week, of course, we'll be back to, to probably talk about that, but also talk about the more important thing leading into that weekend, which is the Portland Thorns are going to be hosting a NWSL semifinal match against Gotham. Kind of a sketchy matchup, but interesting but one and compelling as well and just a few weeks ago at home. exactly yeah and they they did well a few weeks ago and, and we will get into all the details of that next week this week more of the tempers post-mortem next week we'll, we'll dive in um head first into into the nwsl playoffs as the thorns seek their fourth nwsl title um so so keep an eye out for that next week follow us on twitter at soccer maiden pdx at ryan t clark at chris reifer uh, like us, subscribe to us wherever you get your pods. Any any parting thoughts? Absolutely. Please don't hire Phil Neville. <laughs> that's it. That's that's my last thought. Thank you, Chris, for your candid analysis as always. Uh, and and make sure to, if you have not yet, please leave us a review wherever you get your pods. Love to hear back from people. Constructive criticism, complete and unrelenting adoration, whatever you want to provide. We are here for it. So, so thanks everybody for listening and we'll catch you next week.